Am I right in saying that? Nothing we do. Sometimes we think that it's us who's trying to pray. It's not us trying to pray. It's the Lord who's helping us and enabling us to pray. So it's the work of the Lord. So even this evening, it is my delight and my joy and my privilege to begin to speak to you on these lines. The second verse and the second portion of that verse, it says, and in his law, he meditates day and night. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And arising out of that verse number three, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. And that's what I'm going to be sharing this evening about. I'm going to be starting with this. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Well, the word law there in the original text is the word Torah. The word Torah. Or uh, my, my uh, Strong's tells me it's instruction. The word Torah, though it refers to the books of Moses, my, Bible, my, my Strong's tells me it is instruction. So when we say the law, we're not predominantly referring to the law of Moses, but we're talking by and large about the word of God. So the Bible tells me in his law, which refers to direction, instruction. And I'm just reading out to you what the Strong says. It is called direction. It's called instruction. It's called prophetic teaching. I like that. The word law is also translated as prophetic teaching. And again, the same word law, the Strong's tells me, it refers to instruction in the Messianic age. So we're not stuck with just the five books of the Bible, the initial five books. We're talking about instruction in the Messianic age. The next meaning of this word, the law, is body of priestly direction or instruction. Very deep, very deep words. Body of priestly direction or instruction. The last word, the last meaning of this word Torah, which means the law, also says body of legal directives. Very deep meaning. <clears throat> the Bible says, and in this law, in this direction, a Talmud shall dwell in. If you say you're a Talmud or a disciple, these are the attributes of one. A disciple is not just somebody who calls himself one, but rather somebody whose life proclaims these things. And the Bible says in his law or the instruction or the direction, he meditates day and night. Can you say the word meditate? What is the meaning of the word meditate? No, I remember when I, when I thought about the word meditate, my, when my mind went back to my history books as I was in school. And this, this religious guru received an insight as he meditated under a particular tree. You know who I'm talking about. So the meditation part seems to be very insignificant here. Uh, maybe to the positive or to the negative. Somebody received an instruction as they were meditating under a certain tree. So meditation by itself, I think is a grand word. Meditation. And let me just give you the word meditation. I'm going to give you some meanings and it makes a lot of sense. The word meditation, please write it down if you will. It is the Hebrew word Haga. H-A-G-A. It's the word Haga. H-A-G-A. Okay, and you'll be really uh, interested by the meaning of this word, Haga, H-A-G-A. -A. The word Haga really is, in, write it down, murmur. It's interesting, M-U-R-M-E-R, -E murmur. Thanks. Murmur. When we talk about murmur, we talk about complaint, but the word Haga is to murmur. Write down the second meaning of the word. It means Ponder. Ponder. The word meditation is an interesting word. It means to murmur. Let me explain that in a couple of minutes. But then it's murmur. It's, the next meaning is ponder. P-O-N-D-E-R. To think about constantly. That's what it means. The next word is again very interesting. The word is meditate. 
Meditate. Write down the next word. Interesting again. Imagine. I-M-A-G-I-N-E. Imagine. The word is imagine. So when we talk about this, we are talking about murmuring. And let me explain that to you. It is not on a negative connotation, but rather in the positive. And let me explain that to you. But the Bible goes on to tell me, it's, it's to ponder, it's to imagine, it's to meditate. In other words, it's to mutter. M-U-T-T-E-R. Mutter. Write it down, it'll help you. Mutter. M-U-T-T-E-R. Mutter. The next meaning, I'm simply reading to you out of the Strong's reference. Straight away. I'm reading out of the strong reference. The next word is uh, speak, S-P-E-A-K, to speak. Interesting. And all the while we thought meditation was ha ha something happening inside our brain. But imagine the words mutter refer refers to something vocal. Medit speak, something, it refers to something vocal. Another word is talk, it refers to something vocal. And the word utter. U-T-T-R, to speak forth, utter something. Remember the words, imagine. Very important words. So when you're referring to something like, in his law he meditates, you're talking to, 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 a, to, to this word is so powerful, it encompasses so many attributes. It just not sit there and think about, which is definitely included in the meaning, but I think it's much, much, much more than just that. No, a Talmud, a disciple of Jesus Christ, he's not a Talmud because he declares himself to be one, but a Talmud is a Talmud simply because he does these things. Will somebody say amen? I hope we are not just Talmuds on the outside, but Talmuds really on the inside. You know what I'm saying. It's easy for us to call ourselves a disciple of Jesus Christ, but at the end of the day, it is what you do which qualifies you to be an apostle, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in his law... He meditates. Now, the word meditate, again, let me just give you a couple of, you know, trying to draw a picture for you. The word is to imagine. All right. So when you're talking about meditate, it's just not sitting there under a tree and so-called so uh, uh, muttering something. Rather, it also means to imagine. That means a, a Talmud is the one who meditates, who imagines what the scriptures are saying. Now keep that in mind because I'm going to make a connection now. In the morning we were doing a, you know, our uh, workshop, right? For those of you who had been for the workshop, we, we said that our brain works in pictures. Our brain works in pictures. Everything you say, it is pictures. The mind takes pictures and that's how it recalls. So I, I did a small exercise in the, in the morning. And so let me just you know, see if I can work that out. I said to everybody, would you please close your eyes, all right? And I said, after they closed their eyes, I said, imagine a black dog. Uh -huh. I just said that. I said, imagine a black dog. And I said, imagine this black dog, which is hairy, running towards you, okay? And then later I said, please open up your eyes. I was afraid they're going to sleep off, but woke them up. And then I said to them, what do you see? What did you see? They said, we did see a black dog. Now. When we studied English in our schools, they told us black was B-L-A-C-K, right? They told us a dog was D-O-G. So when I said, would you imagine a, a, a D-O-G, nobody saw D-O-G, but they rather saw a dog itself. You understand what I'm saying? So the mind is able to capture words and translate them into pictures. So that's the power of the human mind, to imagine Every great invention was firstly imagined. Everything is created twice. It's created once on the inside and the second time it is created on the outside. Everything is created twice. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And even before it was created, he knew what is to be created because he saw what is to be created. The same thing with your life and mine. We see what happens with us. We see ourselves. We see growth. We see our life expanding. We see good things happen. It's in the power of the mind to even imagine these things. Will you say amen? God has given you the power of imagination. To imagine great things. So watch the word imagine. Keep that in your mind. I'm going to make a connection very, quick, very quickly. Okay. The next word is the word mutter. 
The word mutter. The word mutter is what? I mean, especially we know what mutter is, uh, especially if you're angry with somebody. And you do not want to show them that you're angry. We kind of mutter under our breath. And, you know, when somebody, you can't complain straight away, but we don't know that this person, you know what I'm saying? We mutter and we complain about certain somebody inside under our very breath, but just audible enough to let somebody know, I'm not happy with you. The word mutter is that, is to speak that word consistently and constantly. The next word, I mean, very interesting, is the word speak. Is the word speak. So imagine, so when the word says in his law, he meditates, it means to literally speak the word. It's not meditation as in just listening and doing nothing about it. It means imagination. It refers to speaking. I'll talk to you about that as well. The importance of how and what we say is of prime importance. So it talks about meditating or speaking. But in his, but a Talmud meditates in the word of God. <laughs> when? Day and night. Can you say day and night? One more time, day and night. All right. Now, this is interesting. Now, to me, the one of the reasons is, is very interesting. When the Lord says, a Talmud shall meditate day and night, uh, we have a problem with time <laughs> so as to speak to, to even fulfill what a Talmud is expected to do, isn't it? It's, it's, it's interesting. It says, a Talmud, if you were a Talmud, you, you spend time uh, in meditation, in, in, in proclaiming, in declaring, in decreeing, in, in stuff, uh, what the Word of God says, imagining great things. And the Bible says, in His law, He meditates day and night. So now watch the connection here. I said to you the word imagine. I asked you to read Ephesians 3.20 when I preached. Can you somebody read for me Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20? Ephesians chapter 3 in verse number 20. Okay, I, I got it, so let me read it to you. And you just follow it or please make a note of this thing. It says, Now to him who is able, referring to our Lord, our Lord indeed is able. So now to him who is able to do how? Exceedingly abundantly. Now the words exceedingly means you know much more than you can even think of exceedingly. Abundantly also means something extravagant, something big which you can't contain. The Bible has problems with vocabulary. English is insufficient to even tell us the grandeur and the greatness of God because it uses the word exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask. Above all that we ask. What? So therefore, first of all, there's nothing wrong in opening your mouth and asking. Okay, that's what the Bible says. It's good for us to open up our mouth and ask something. So the Bible says, our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Can you all say the word exceedingly abundantly? One more time. He will do exceedingly and abundantly about what? First thing, about what? About what? About asking. About our asking. So what is he going to do exceedingly over? On what? Number one, we, what we ask. Can you all say ask? So the most important thing is for us to open up our mouth and ask. That's what the Bible says. So now if we don't ask, God cannot do something more than what we ask and therefore we don't receive. So the Bible says, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. You understand that? Now I, I wish the Bible stopped with the word ask. But it didn't. The Bible says it's above not only just asking, it's about our thinking. Somebody say praise the Lord here. Oh yes. Now I wish it was just asking so I could ask God. But the Bible says no, no, no. The Lord says to you this evening, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to beat you straight on what you ask. I'm not going to stop with that. I'm going to even beat you about way, way, way about what you even think. Will you say amen? God is challenging not only our asking, but also our thinking. He's able to challenge your thinking because he knows that you cannot climb higher than what you think about yourself. You understand that? Can, God cannot do much more than what you think of him. 
His miracles are limited to our thinking capacity. If you think God, this is what I think about, God cannot move higher than what we think because he says it depends on what you ask and what you think. Why? Again, it continues by saying, according to the power that works in us according, in proportion to, in accordance with, the power that works in us so it's accordance it's all it's not equally distributed it's all accordance with if my asking is this level my thinking is this level god cannot do this level so the bible talks about oh this is superb psalm chapter one the verses we are meditating on it says meditation is the key to growth we delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. That's God's goodness. Praise God for delighting in that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord says, no, no, no. If you want to get something out of me, it's not just desiring, but it needs to be meditated upon. And I said, meditation is just not thinking under us and, 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 you know, in a position where we just think about the goodness of God. The Bible says meditation is imagination. It is speaking. It is muttering. It is uttering. That means when whatever happens to you, you open up that mouth of yours. When you're traveling in a place, you mutter the word of God. You speak it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You understand what I'm saying? Muttering. Constantly. Because we are programmed as human beings with the potential to imagine. Now, Hang in with me. I'm going to make the connection. All right. Can you all say imagine? I said all. Okay. Ah, you got me now. Thank you. Go back to Psalm chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Psalm chapter 1. Hmm. Can you say praise the Lord? That's right. He's good. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, can all of you say imagine again? One more time. So, what is the word meditation? It means also imagine. All right. So, now the Bible is going to draw you a picture. Draw you a picture. Watch verse number three. And he shall be. Like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You got that right? Now because muttering and uttering and imagination go hand in hand. The word meditation means imagination. The word meditating means uttering. The word imagination means muttering. The word meditation means speaking, talking. So now the Lord says, I'm going to draw you a picture of how a Talmud will be. And he said, this is what it's going to be. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, if you ever, you know, traveled around, especially this beautiful place and uh, maybe on the end route to this campsite, uh, you have seen rivers, small ones, rivers. And you see the flourishing trees on both the banks of these rivers. Seem green and so healthy. Why? Because there's immense amount of water. And the Lord says, I'm going to let you know and give you a picture about yourself. He said, the Talmud will do this. He will, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? A tree planted by the rivers of water. Green and lush. The Bible says, he brings forth fruit in his season. Whose leaf also shall not wither. Can you see the picture of your own, in your own mind about a Talmud? You know, do you see it? You see that, right? A green tree. Now let me just bring all this to understanding, okay? Now the Bible talks about what is the tree and what is the water. What is the tree? What is the water? What is the tree and what is the water? And so the tree refers to a Talmud who delights himself in the Lord and who utters, who mutters, who imagines according to what the word of God is saying. Alright, that's a Talmud. And that's the person who will bring forth his fruit in the season. And I believe and pray each one of us are called.
all to bring forth fruit in our season. Will you say amen? That's God's plan. Will you say amen to that? No, yes. You are called to bring forth fruit in season. Will you say amen? That's God's plan for you. Whether you like it or not, God's plan is to bring forth fruit in the season. And whose leaf shall not wither. So now, Ephesians, Paul writes to the Ephesian church and makes a connection between the tree who is a Talmud and let's see what the water is. The book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse number 26. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Let's go to the New Testament to see what the apostle Paul has been talking about when he refers to water. The psalmist wrote this. Let's see what the New Testament, the New Covenant teaching has to say about water. Verse number 26 of Ephesians chapter number 5. You got it? Did you get it or not? Yes or no? Okay, fair. Okay. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You understand that? So he's referring to a human being in relation to imagination of a tree planted by the rivers of water. What is the water? Water is the word. So for us to be strong, the Lord is saying, listen, the only thing you must do, if we want to be a flourishing tree, be planted by the word. Will somebody say amen? That's the picture he's drawing here. I hope we get to see the picture. He says, a Talmud, you say you're a Talmud? Yeah. If I say I'm a Talmud, you, you better know this, that you are going to prosper. Imagine yourself prospering. But the Bible says it will happen only if you're planted near the water. The water is nothing but the word. So a Talmud, a disciple of Jesus Christ, gains his strength. He is strong. He is mighty. He is powered. He is empowered by the word of the living God. Somebody say amen. No other way. Now let me give you a little bit of understanding about the power of meditation. Right? I want to give you a little bit of understanding about the true power of meditation. Go with me please if you will to the book of Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119. I know it's a big psalm but we're going to read from verse number 97. The book of Psalm chapter number 119 verse number 97 onwards. Okay, are you there? Are you there? Okay. Right, I'm, I'm good that you respond, right? Okay, let's follow with it. 97. This is what the psalmist says. He says, oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your law. The word law again is the word Torah. And your strongs will give you the same definition of the word law. It means instruction, direction, body of prophetic teaching. Instruction in messianic age, body of a priestly direction or instruction, and body of legal director. It's the same word. Lest we misunderstand it only for the law as in a limited sense. It means much more than that. All right. So how I love your law, said the psalmist. This man was in love with the word of God. It says, it is my meditation all the day. Now, please understand this. I'm going to say a few things now. Okay. Now, this, the David was a busy man he was a king all right now he had thousands of things to do administration of the whole israel you know he had a lot and lot of lot of things he was a busy man but yet he says i meditate in the law or the torah all day so he found himself meditating on the scriptures now if we are talking about being busy i think we must get an insight from this man's life the life of king david being a busy man he still did do had had the time to spend time with and meditate all the day. The word meditation I already gave you the meaning. I'm not getting into it. So this man is not only muttered. He didn't even much just imagine. He didn't just speak it. He, he he talked about it. He lived it. He breathed the word of God. He says it is my meditation all the day. Now watch this verse number ninety eight. He says, "You." I mean, this is mind blowing. All right, hang in with me. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. Somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> you 
through the meditation watch this very carefully see we have enemies enemies in different forms not necessarily attacks but subtle enemies the world system is trying to override us the system of the world i spoke to you about yesterday the system the world system the the council of the ungodly is trying to overtake us how do i say strong how does how do i win over that enemy how do i win over an enemy which doesn't have features which doesn't have hands it doesn't have legs it doesn't have eyes it's a subtle system how do i overtake that how do i overcome that the bible says i love your law and in that law i meditate all the day and this man was busy man he was a wise man too because he says to himself it's no point trying to rule a country without first of all ruling me and the only way i can rule me is to rule the word which rules me when i have the word inside me i have a edge over my enemies he says through your commandments arising out of meditation he says you make me wiser than my enemies will somebody say praise the lord oh my goodness i wish i had some witness here to tell myself how great it is to have an edge over my enemies do you want to have an edge over your enemies <laughs> i'm asking you a question do you want to have an edge over your enemies obviously yes because our enemies are very subtle my friend i wish <coughs> our enemy had two horns i wish my enemy had a pinched tail fork of a tail you know understand that i wish my enemy came in a black garb so i see him i can go and attack him but this enemy is invisible it's a system it's a system we are battling perversion has come in new shapes in new dimensions it is not that thing which comes in front of you with with claws and and a, a grotesque looking face it's a system that comes to destroy and slowly erode our christian values why i say that i was talking to a young youth group sometime back in a, one particular church we were talking about you know you, the yesteryears just look at the movie system yesteryears oh if you if you were to talk to senior people very senior people i mean if they had ever watched a movie the most romantic scene in that entire movie was this man and a woman holding hands together that would be the climax of the movie whereas today jumping in bed the very next scene is commonplace our morality has been eroded it's a subtle enemy it's a subtle enemy it comes in as a system to do just disengage us of the things of god it comes in very subtly this is our enemy we are facing to this day i wish as i said again my enemy had hands and legs my enemy doesn't have hands and legs it's a culture it's a system that we've got inside of us and the bible tells me oh he says you make me wiser than my enemies how nice it would be if this person who came to you talking to you so well and this word which is inside of you reminded you and gave you a new insight about this dece deception which is facing you and he says do not trust this person you have an edge over your enemies will you say amen mm. i wish i spent more time in meditation because that thing i got into i wouldn't have got into if i had spent time meditating because this word it gives me an edge over my enemies the subtle person who came and said he loves you and you believed him and you trusted him and he broke your heart into a thousand pieces i wish that you meditated because out of the meditation there is a revelation about the inside of the cunningness in this deception in this man's heart and you would be able to look through the deception because the bible says you make me wiser than my enemies you do not know he's an enemy he doesn't come like an enemy he comes masqueraded even as an angel of light but when the word is inside of you when you mutter when you utter when you speak that word when you meditate on the word and you begin to speak according to the word there's a revelation on the inside it reveals the enemy though he's clad like an angel i'm telling you meditation is the key will somebody say amen i wish i had meditated i wouldn't have got myself into that trouble i wish i had to spend little more time 
in whatever I've been doing and leaving that aside and spending time in meditation. Oh God, I wish I would have saved my tr life's troubles which were so big I would have avoided it because the Bible tells me I, I make me this this word makes me wiser than my enemies not only that <laughs> this is the, what the psalmist says for they are ever with me he's talking about this description of his enemies huh? he said this enemy doesn't come once in, one, once in a while right with me some of our enemies are eating out of our own tables We've been through a business loss. A business loss. I wish that we had meditated a little bit more so that the subtlety of the one who speaks so good would be revealed. I had an edge over my enemies. We wish. Hmm. We would, have, we would have saved a lot of tears. We would have saved a lot of heartbreaks. I wish. The Lord is speaking to you. I wish. That you would be a word person meditating so that this edge will give you that supernatural you know, safety from your enemies. Will somebody say amen? Verse 99. Now watch this. What does the meditation cost? Number one, it gives you an edge over your enemies. Number two, I mean, look at these words. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Not one teacher. I don't know how many subjects you have in college or school. Now, this man says, I am wiser than all of them. Isn't that interesting? I'm wiser than every single one of them. Why? For your testimonies are my meditation. Testimonies are my meditation. He says, you know what? Your good things I've done. He said to himself, once I was walking out with my, with my, uh, with my flock of sheep, there came a bear. And God, thank you for your empowering. I ripped the bear as if I ripped a piece of paper. He thought about that and he gave God thanks. Even when he was doing nothing, this thing came to his mind and he said, God, I give you thanks for the miracle you have done. He meditated on the good things of God. That's why when he saw Goliath, he was not moved. Why? Because he had meditated on the good things of God when he tore that, that bear apart. And for him, an, an, a man who, an uncircumcised Philistine, was no match for the great God. So he said, what's the big deal? I can rip him the same way. Because he was meditating on the script. That's what the Bible tells me. He says, I have, my testimonies are my meditation. Your testimonies, he says. I've been meditating on your good things. Let's go on. Let's go on. Verse number 100. This again is a mind blower. I understand more than the ancients. Who are the ancients? The wise ones. The ones with experience. The ones who, have, who are the masters of the subject. He said, I understand more. He's wiser than all the teachers put together. He's got an edge over his enemies. And he also says, I understand more than the ancients. What a place to be. What a place to be. Will somebody say amen? Are you understanding what I'm saying? The power in meditation. This is what a Talmud really is. An edge over things. An edge over circumstances. Now, I did a quick study on the Bible about the word tree. And I want to just explain to you the word tree in the, from the Bible in at least three different locations, the, quick, the quickly I can, and then I'll tie all this together, and I'm going to go and take my seat. Okay, so let's go. Book of Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 8. And this is a verse which complements what we've been reading, Psalm chapter 1. This is a complement to that, right? Jeremiah number 17 and verse number 8 onwards. This supplements 
Psalm chapter number one. Okay, are you there? Are you there? Okay, let me ask you again. Are you there? All right. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. Now what happens when you're planted by the waters? Jeremiah tells us, he spreads out its roots by the river. And he will not fear when heat comes. When the pressures of life bring in heat into your life, the Bible says a person who spread out next to the rivers where he's drawing from the water of the word will be strong and secure because his roots are spread out wide. No storm can topple him down. And not only that, the Bible says he will not fear when troublous times come. But its leaf will be green. Somebody say hallelujah. Your, green, your leaves will be green. Let the storms come. Your leaf will be green. Let the heat come upon you. You will not wither away. Let the storms overtake you. You are not going to fall. Because your roots are well planted in the word of meditation. Watch the next line. And will not be anxious in the year of drought. Do you take that verse for yourself? Do you like to take that verse for yourself? And will you say amen if that's the case? Okay, if you want to take it, take it and say amen. Because amen simply means hmm, yes to it. Okay, I'm going to read it again. If it's you, please take it, right? Watch this. <clears throat> he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, who spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. Will you say amen? Mm, I'm going to I'm going to wait for your next amen I'll right here. Right. He says his leaf will be green will not fear when heat comes and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Please say amen if you believe it. Now watch this. Nor will cause cease sorry nor will cease from yielding fruit. Hallelujah. I want to be a blessed. Yeah, you want to give a clap? Please give a clap to the Lord. Come on, everybody. This is a picture of somebody who meditates in the scriptures. I mean, he's going to have cutting edge. And I want to do that. I want to be blessed in every single thing I do. All right. As I said, let's go quickly, please. Very quickly. The book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 9. Genesis chapter 2, two and verse number 9. Now, the word tree, the, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, is the beginning of all things. And therefore, when we see the meaning of a particular word, it's always good to go and inspect into the first book of beginnings, which is the book of Genesis. And there you can take out the extract, the meaning of the word tree. So let's go to the verse number nine. It says, and the Lord God made a tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Will somebody say amen? God made a tree. And he put, actually he made the garden of Eden. And the Bible says, and God made every tree grow. That's good. And he also says, he put a tree called the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So basically there was trees. And there was one special tree, which was a tree of life. And God's desire for this tree was man would partake of this tree and have a glorious existence. But also, there was another tree. And I, interestingly, this tree, we are, what we're talking about, was in the midst. Somebody say midst. So that you don't miss it. You don't miss it. It's in the midst of the garden. It was not in some corner because, you know, God didn't want Adam to go searching for the tree. It was in the midst of the garden. But then the Bible also says, God also made the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He made another tree. Now the question many people would ask is, why did God ever make the tree? All right. If the Lord did not make the tree, man would be free from sin. Isn't it so? Right. But there's a simple answer to this, to this complicated question. 
Now God made man in his own image, in his own likeness. And when you say he was made in the image and likeness of God, I would like to attribute that image and likeness to the very fact that he can make a choice just like God would. Man was created with a free will to make a choice. That's why you are seated here having made a choice to come. Basically many things in creation have no choice. They just follow instinct. Whereas you and me have the power to make a choice. So when God gave you the power to make a choice, there must also be a possibility to go into evil. When I say evil, there must be a possibility of doing wrong to pride yourself of doing right. I hope you understand what I'm saying. If there was no possibility of doing wrong, how can you pride yourself of doing right? A choice means a decision between two entities. So now when you say no to certain things and say yes to God, that's when God says, I know you truly love me because you didn't make a choice. So if there's no tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man, if it was not there, man couldn't have chosen that. So man by default becomes a robo. And God doesn't want no robos in the kingdom of God. He wants to have sons and not robos. A son would willingly love the parent. That's the choice he makes. And because you're the child of God, God gives you the opportunity to go do right, yet giving you the possibility to do wrong. And he keeps you in the place and says, in Deuteronomy, let's not get there, Deuteronomy 30, the Lord says, I place before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And he gives you the answer. I love this question paper because not only does it ask me questions, it also gives me the answer. What is the answer? Choose life. Just in case we didn't get it, choose life that you and your descendants may live. You got what I'm saying? I mean the question paper has the answer. I love this. Choose life. But man, for whatever reason, choose wrong. We're not getting into that. Leave it alone there. But I want to let you know something. The tree mentioned there is this. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. I love something here. I did a small study. It's a very interesting thing. I'm sure you'll be blessed by what I'm going to tell you. Now, verse number 10. Well, let's leave the story of the fall for now. And let's pick up at verse number 10. Now, the Bible tells me after God made the, the trees, and especially these two trees, in verse number 10, it says... Now a river, watch the picture, watch the picture, the same picture in Psalm chapter 1, same picture, you see a tree, you see river, you see water, same thing, God made a tree and you see a picture of a river, went out of Eden to water the garden, same picture. In the book of beginnings, the same picture. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Jeremiah says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Same picture, watch this. And our river went out of Eden to water the garden. Oh, praise the Lord. And from there it parted and became four river heads or four tributaries. One became four. Now, please write these things down. It's going to bless you. Number one, verse number 11. Watch this. The name of the four rivers are this. Number one. The name of the first, verse number one, 11, I'm sorry. It says the first is, Pishon, P-I-S-H-O-N. Write the word P-I-S-H-O-N. And when I give you the meaning, it's going to give you a beautiful picture. The name of the first is Pishon, P-I-S-H-O-N. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. Now, the man, God mentions gold. In the, in the Garden of Eden, there was gold. And the Bible tells me in verse number 12, that gold of that land is good. It's a good gold. God seemed to be putting gold right there, okay? For those of you who are against gold, gold is right there in the Bible. Just a side note. Okay. Verse number 13. The first one is called Pishon. The second one, verse number 13. The name of the second river now is Gihon. G-I-H-O-N. I'm not a Hebrew student, so if my pronunciation is not right, please forgive me. All right, G I H O N 13, verse number 13. The next one is again the verse number, uh, I'm sorry, the verse number 11. The first one is uh, Pishon, verse number 13 is Gihon. The third one is found in verse number 14, 1 4. The name of the third river is Hidikel, 
H-I-D-D-E-K-E-L. Hidikel. The name of the third river is Hidikel. In the same verse 14, you find the name of the fourth river. It says the fourth river is the Euphrates. The fourth river is Euphrates. Now, please give me your attention. I know you're writing it down, but just give me your attention. Now, I'm going to give you the meaning of these four rivers. All right, the four rivers. The name Pishon, P-I-S-H-O-N. You can write the word down. It's increase. It's called increase. Increase. Verse number 11. Pishon, increase. The next river is Gihon, G-I-H-O-N. It means bursting forth. Bursting forth. Verse number 14. Hidikel. It means rapid, R-A-P-I-D, rapid, fast, rapid, unstoppable, rapid. And the fourth one, Euphrates, it is called fruitfulness, fruitfulness. Okay, you got that? So I believe what these four rivers, imagine tree planted by streams of living water. This is what it means. It means, watch this very carefully, fruitfulness increase bursting forth rapidly uh, it says in, let me just just read these words out it means increase bursting forth rapidly towards fruitfulness oh praise the lord you like that right that's the simple word if you read it like that it simply means increase bursting forth rapidly towards fruitfulness that's what it means the four rivers to water the plants will somebody say amen I did some work there. I thought you would say an amen to that. In finding all these meanings just to let you know. Mm. Increase bursting forth rapidly towards fruitfulness. This is the plan of God. He puts a tree and he puts these things around you and says, I want to increase you in a bursting forth manner rapidly to propel you towards fruitfulness. Will somebody say Amen. I'm going to say amen to myself if you're not going to say amen. Amen, amen to me. You want to say amen to yourself? Receive it. The interesting thing is this. Verse number 15. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Can you say after me please? To tend and keep it. Imagine the Lord makes the trees, the rivers, meaning this awesome word, meaning increase, bursting forth rapidly towards fruitfulness. And when he's got everything in place, the Bible says the Lord took the man and put him in the garden for one job. What's the job? Tend and keep. Can you say after me please? Tend and keep. That means man has a job. Man has a responsibility. You have a responsibility. What God has given unto us as a Talmud, planting us by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in our season. All these things are true, but my job is to tend and keep my position. Tend and keep my ground. I don't let the devil get close to me. I don't let vain, ungodly words get to me. I don't get the world system into me. I tend and keep my life. I tend and protect myself. You understand that? Man's job was to tend and keep it. The Lord told him, let me give you the meaning of what it means to tend and to keep. Just in case we get a little bit wondering about what is to tend the garden and keep the garden. I mean, wasn't the garden flourishing by itself? Yes, it was. But let me see what the Bible says. It says the Lord said to him in verse number 16, the Lord God commanded. It's just not just a suggestion. It's a commandment. The Lord commanded of man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Can you say freely? That's the key. Everything of God, free. You don't have to pay for it. It's a free thing. All right, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for they that you shall eat of it you shall surely die surely 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 die 
In other words, what is it to tend and keep the garden? I'm going to bring it to the simplest terms ever possible. It simply means to listen and do. That's it. Bring it down to some simple elements. Hear and do. Tend and keep. What does it mean? Hear and do. Well, marriage scenario, what do I do? Tending and keeping in my marriage. To hear and do. I have an issue. What do I do? I listen. Tend and do. Hear. Basically, it's nothing but listening and doing what it said. Very simple terms. When you're talking about tending and keeping, I want to let you know, my friend, this evening. Now, just in case you haven't understood this, each one of us have our own Eden. You have your own Eden. Every single one of us have our own Eden. That Eden is our space. It's where God has put us in. He's caused us to be in this place and he's given us a territory called our Eden, our home, our place. And the Lord says it is your duty to tend it and keep it and keep off the evil one from entering it because he will come subtly. He will come to deceive. He will come to steal. He'll come to kill. He will come to destroy. But I'm going to let you know that in me there is life in abundance. Your job is to tend and keep that garden. Will somebody say amen? The greatest job for a Christian <coughs> tend. Excuse me. Tend and keep the garden. The Bible says if you do, what happens to you? You will die. Can you say die? Die is not just die. You know, when you say die, we think, you know, we don't obey. Boom, die. No, die means disconnection from the source. Die simply means disconnected from the source. You take a tree, you take a tree or take a flower, cut the stem, keep it in your home, in a vase of water, it looks good. Just for a few hours. Why? It has been disconnected from its source. Take a bird from its source, which is the air, and put it in a place where it shouldn't be, for example, under water, the bird dies. Why? Because it is disconnected from the source. You treat you and me, pluck us out of God, disconnect ourselves from God, we die spiritually the tree teaches us one lesson the Lord prepared everything for Adam and then put man and Adam right in the place of all this flourishing gave him the water of the word gave him everything that he needs and gave him an instruction you and I are on this earth with an instruction the instruction is the word. The word of God. If we don't pay heed to the word, we die. That's why marriages fall apart. That's why we break down. Because we don't take heed to meditating the word. When you meditate the word, that's when you become sharper than your enemies. When you meditate the word, you become wiser than the ancients. When you meditate the word, you become more smarter than all your enemies put together. All your teachers. Why? Because it's the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory. So when we see Jesus, it's the word in action. What Jesus spoke is life. What Jesus does, did is strength. So when you see him, when you listen to his word, it's life. John chapter 6 and verse 63, it says, The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Just not words. Just not words. I know it contains 26 alphabets, but that's just not the important thing. The Bible tells me that these words are spirit and they are life. Somebody say amen. When these words get into your spirit, man, and when it stays there and it begins to grow, it's spirit. It grounds you in the things of God. Will somebody say amen? The second occurrence, the word tree in the Bible. There are many occurrences. I'm just picking up three. The second one is found in the book of Mark, the 11th chapter. Let's get there, please, if you will. 
Mark chapter number 11. Mark chapter 11. I'm going to read for you a few verses. From verse number 12. Mark chapter 11 and verse number 12. Verse number 12 says, He came from Bethany. Came out from Bethany. He was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Alright. Verse number 13 says, And he see from afar a fig tree having leaves. He went to see perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now give me your attention, please. The next reference to is a tree which did not bear fruit. A fig tree. I went through a little bit of, you know, um, uh, exposition on the subject. Now, it said to me that whenever you see a tree with leaves especially a fig tree it's an indication that you have fruits okay so that's what the commentary told me he told me that every time you see a fig tree with leaves uh, it's an indication that it produced fruit so jesus was hungry all right after a ministry trip he went and came back he was hungry and from there he spotted a fig tree and then he went in anticipation hoping that that fig tree would give him the fruit and satisfy that that could satisfy his hunger so when he went to the fig tree, he found nothing but leaves. Can you say nothing? One more time, nothing. Hmm. He expected something. He came there with anticipation, expected something. And the Bible says, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. That's why I told you there's an indication of leaves. When there's an indication of leaves, it means there's a fruit. All right, that's what it means. So the Bible says it was not the season for fix. Verse number 14 is an interesting word. I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says in response. What does your Bible say? Verse number 14. He responded. He says, he replied. What, what does your Bible say? He spoke to it. What did he say? Just the two first two words. I beg your pardon? Okay, he responded. No, 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 no. In response, verse number 14. My Bible says, in response, Jesus said. What does your Bible say? He said to it. Simple as that. Let's stick to that. He said to it. Now watch it. Now watch this. Please understand. Give me your attention. My time is running out on me. The important thing is, Jesus looks at a fig tree. And then he talks to the fig tree. And the Bible says, he responded. Now listen to me. Or he spoke back to it. Nobody speaks to a fig tree. Does anybody speak to a fig tree? And you can speak to a fig tree in a certain sense, but the Bible doesn't say he spoke to it. The Bible says he responded and he said to it. That means his speaking was in response to a question. Jesus is expecting a response from our lives. We are the trees planted by the rivers of water. And this God who made you, gave you talents, gave you resources, Give you eyes to see, ears to hear, legs to walk, hands to move, a heart to understand. He saved you, washed you, cleansed you, put you on this earth and gave you a purpose and a direction. And if you and I don't obey what the Lord says, he's waiting to see what you got to tell him. He's waiting for fruit from your life. In response, Jesus said to him, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. I'm afraid of these words. Because he has capacitated me with things. And if I'm not going to fall through with those things. Oh, this is what I'm going to be hearing. He said to that servant who dug up that, you know, one denarii or whatever not. And put it and hit it up. And, and he said, Lord, I know you're a very weak, hard man. I know you're a hard man. That's why I buried my talent. You know what the Lord said? He said, take that one and give it to the one who has. God's equation is different. 
take the one who's got it, hidden it, hid it right inside that hole. Oh, he's not even worthy to hold it because I gave him time. I gave him opportunity. I gave him all these things. I gave him resources. I planted him by the trees of, of, of a river of water. He has not done anything for me. In response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. I'm afraid of that. It talks to me as a Talmud. I have a responsibility. It tells me God has equipped me with things. God has equipped me with talents and a lot of other things. And he's put me here for a purpose and I'm called to fulfill his purpose. The last but not the least. Galatians, the third chapter, please. Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 13. The third reference to a tree in the Bible. Galatians the third chapter and verse number 13. Let's go and talk about our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh praise the Lord. Christ, are you there? Will you say amen if you're there please? Are you there? Are you there? Okay. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. We spoke yesterday in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he became sin. But now the Bible tells me he became a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs tree. Tree. This tree is totally different. It's the tree which is called Calvary. This tree took care of the rest of the issues of mankind. In this tree, the creator was crucified. In this tree, the one who created the heavens and the earth hung for you and me. It's a wonderful tree. A tree where, which absorbed the sin of mankind. This tree became a curse because it bare our sins on himself. That's what the Bible says. Cursed is everyone who hangs on. He became cursed. Now my question is, why did he become cursed like yesterday? Why did he become sin? Let's read verse number 14. He was cursed. Verse number 14 tells me it is in order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, which is you and me, in Christ Jesus. Will somebody say hallelujah? The reason he became a curse is so that the blessings which is found in Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord spoke a blessing on Abraham's life. He said, in blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying I'll multiply thee. He said, I'm going to make you a blessing. Your name shall be lifted up great. I'm calling you from obscurity to notoriety. I'm going to make you a blessing to nations. And Abraham said, yes Lord, I agree to that. And the Bible says that blessing of Abraham may come upon me in Christ Jesus. Will somebody say amen? It's all is possible because of that one tree, the tree called Calvary, where the king of glory died. He gave up the ghost just because he loves you. The Bible tells me he became a sin that I can become a son. He became a curse that the blessing of Abraham may come upon me. He became nothing that I can be something. He called his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In order that I can call my father Abba. Three trees. Remember this. I'm going to close with this verse. Psalm chapter 52 and verse number 8. I would kindly request you to stand to your feet as you open up that scripture as I begin to close. Open up your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalm, the 52nd chapter, and verse number 8. And let's all stand to our feet as I close this session. Will you kindly stand to your feet? Oh, praise the Lord. I want all of us to read the scripture. Every single one of us to believe the scripture. And you've got to confess the scripture just like you mean it. If you mean it, you're going to read, read it to the Lord as you mean it. The book of Psalm, the 52nd chapter and verse number 8. Are you ready? Let's go. 1, 2, and 3. But I am 
like an olive tree in the house of the Lord. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it and in the presence of your saints I will wait on your name for it is good. Verse number 8 one more time. I am like a green olive tree. Now watch a green olive tree implanted in the house of the Lord. Lift your hands as we praise him. Close your Bibles, lift your hands, lift your voices and begin to open up your mouth and decree and declare to him, I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in his season. Hallelujah. All that I do will prosper because I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I thank you, Lord. I am called for greater things. Somebody open up your mouth. You are called to be a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. God has put you in places of living water. The word of God. The access you have to that word. The access you have to the throne room of God. The access you have to participate in the riches and the grandeur of God. Because the Bible says we are co-heirs of Christ. The Bible says, four river heads. Let me prophesy this over your life. Pishon, increase, bursting forth in rapid succession towards fruitfulness. This is what the four rivers signify. When you are planted by the tree of living waters, I decree and declare there is an increase over your life. It will come bursting forth rapidly towards making you fruitful. Will somebody receive this word and say, Amen, that's me. I'm going to increase. I'm going to burst forth. I'm going to be in fruitfulness. I'm going to enlarge my territory. I'm going to go better and better. I'm enlarging in everything I do. Somebody say, that's me. I grow and am planted in the house of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody lift your voice and give Jesus a praise. Open your mouth and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. Open your mouth and say, God, I want you to make a commitment right now. Say, God, I want to be that tree planted by that river of water to meditate your scriptures because it all happens when I utter, when I mutter, when I begin to bring these things into my mind's perspective, when I begin to imagine growth, when I mean, when I see awesome things happen. Oh God, that can happen only when I realize and understand the word of God. It's the word of God which is going to propel me to greater things left by myself. My mind is not that very big but God, if I put your word in my spirit man, there's an increase there's a supernatural launch hallelujah and i'm in that place i want to launch myself and i i know it's by delighting myself in the word of god it's by meditating it's by muttering it's by uttering give me that grace somebody say amen spirit of god we give you praise tonight come on can somebody open your mouth and give god a praise come on people come on people Come on, people. As I said, meditation is means talking. Can't we open up our mouth in response to this holy God? Say, God, you're going to change my life. You're going to change my direction. I speak fruitfulness. I speak increase. I speak rapidly going towards fruitfulness. No more barrenness. No more deficiency. No more curtailed growth. No more abortions. No more stoppage. I grow in the house of the Lord. I am planted in the house of the Lord. Four rivers to take care of me. I am blessed. Because I am a Talmud planted by the rivers of water. God, I did not plant myself. It is your Holy Spirit who has planted me. God, give me the grace even right now to receive that word. Give me the grace right now to meditate on your scriptures. Give me the grace right now to follow through with every single word. Because I want to be wiser than my enemies. Do I have a witness in this house? Oh, praise God. You need some wisdom over your enemies. You need some wisdom over that circumstance. 
circumstance. You need that wisdom over that scenario you're facing. You need wisdom. And how can I get wisdom? It's by spending time with my word. It's by spending time uttering and muttering and dictating the word of God through your lips. When all things fail, put the word in your mouth. The word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Somebody say, Amen. The Bible says, ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock and the doors shall be open unto you. Somebody must open up your mouth. Somebody must knock some doors. Somebody must do some seeking. That's when the doors will begin to open. Somebody say, that's me. I want to start knocking for my miracle. I'm going to keep speaking for my miracle. I imagine greatness over my life. I'm not obscure, but I'm in the light. Somebody say, praise the Lord. That's me. I am going to grow whether you like it or not. Tell your enemies, I'm going to grow whether you like it or not. Tell the devil, I'm going to grow whether you like it or not. There is no stopping me because I'm a person who is meditating in the scriptures. No one can stop me. No demon can stop me. No principality can stop me. No power on earth can stop me. I am in the planted in the house of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we give you praise tonight. I pray each one of us would have, Lord, you have seen our hearts. Our hearts want to be a heart which is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Give us that grace tonight. Give us that grace tonight. Give us that grace tonight. Hallelujah. Will you finally lift your hands to the Lord before I close? Say with me. I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. My leaf shall not wither and all that I do shall prosper. If you believe that, put your hands together. Clap for Jesus.